Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to the second uh, PD and fellow pitches. This is, uh, again, very short, eight-minute uh, you know, program pitches or explanation of recent programs and the explanation of some of the ideas we are working on. Some of the ideas might turn out to be a focused program for upper E later on, but this is uh, uh, really explaining what we are doing, what we are thinking. So if you have been here uh, for the first one, you know what the, the format is. And so there will be a, you know, five talks, eight minutes each, and then we'll have an answering question and answer period at the end, okay? So uh, hold your questions. The question will be sent it digitally uh, through the you know, text. And uh, let me start with uh, Brian Wilson, our program director. He's gonna explain the monitor program. The Monitor Program seeks to develop solutions uh, to quantify methane leakage from oil and gas production sites, thereby facilitating reduction of those emissions and reducing the environmental impact of oil and gas production. Motivation for this is that uh, methane uh, constitutes almost a third of the global radiative climate forcing. In the United States, uh, the largest single source of methane emissions is the oil and gas production system. Unfortunately, current technologies uh, for quantifying methane emissions um, are expensive and are only used in uh, selective research applications. Uh, the uh, monitor program, therefore, asks for the development of technologies to quantify the emissions of methane and to be able to uh, detect where on the well site the leaks occur. The program metrics are on the RPE website, but effectively require that we reduce the cost of methane quantification by a factor of 10 uh, up to a factor of, of uh, 100. We have funded 11 solutions, six complete solutions, and five partial solutions. Complete solutions mean that uh, the project take, uh, seeks to meet all of the metrics that we have described in terms of quantification and location. The uh, partial solutions are focused on developing new quantification technologies, uh, but may not meet all the uh, uh, metrics uh, for determining uh, location and mass flow rate. We have uh, funded five point sensing technology. Uh, these systems typically measure concentration at a single point and then combine that with wind speed and uh, direction data and inverse dispersion modeling to tell where on the site the leak occurred and the mass flow rate of the leak. The state of the art uh, for methane quantification is essentially the tunable laser diode absorption spectrometer. This is a device the size of a microwave oven and typically has a cost of about uh, $100,000. Eris Technologies in uh, the Bay Area, uh, we're funding them to develop a spectrometer that reduces that to the size of an iPhone uh, and is roughly reduces the cost by a factor of 10. Uh, their partner on the project, uh, Los Alamos National Laboratories, is using uh, computational fluid dynamics and artificial neural networks uh, to uh, be, uh, combine with wind data to be able to uh, determine the location mass flow rate of the leaks. The next step in our sort of cost reduction progression uh, is with IBM. And IBM is taking that uh, microwave oven and uh, reducing it to a device the size of a, of a book of matches. And this is roughly a 100x cost reduction. They're basically putting um, lasers, detectors, gas cells, all on a small uh, microchip. We're also funding IBM uh, to, to uh, develop a uh, low-cost, low-powered, wide-area mesh networking system that can ultimately tie together thousands of sensors to be able to predict methane emissions across an entire production basin. And finally, uh, we're funding the Palo Alto Research Center to develop 
an even cheaper uh, uh, chip. And you heard about that this morning from our keynote speaker, where Park is essentially printing uh, dots of nanoparticles on a plastic substrate the size of a credit card. They then functionalize those, uh, uh, those nanotubes um, uh, with different uh, compounds that give different sensitivity to the different compounds uh, in natural gas, allow them very uh, sensitive uh, detection. So this is technology, it represents almost a 1,000, uh, a reduction of almost a factor of 1,000 in the cost of methane sensing. We're funding Duke University put to put additional functionality into sensors. So they're developing a coded aperture mass spectrometer that uh, allows them to detect compounds such as benzene, formaldehyde, and other toxics. We're funding two long distance technologies. Uh, the first is uh, at uh, University of Colorado, National Institute of Standards, and NOAA. They've basically developed a system that can measure um, over a, a, a length of miles. Uh, they're using a uh, femtosecond uh, laser that then uh, creates thousands of discrete uh, frequencies that allow them to give very accurate uh, detection. And then using that um, with computational fluid dynamics, which was supposed to show here, uh, that would uh, show how that dispersion modeling allows them to detect uh, locations with just a few sensors across an entire basin. We're funding uh, General Electric to develop a fiber optic system that go goes along pipelines uh, to determine the location and uh, size of the leak along the pipe. We're funding two aerial technologies. Physical Sciences uh, is, uh, Inc. is com uh, uh, working with Heath Consultants, uh, Thor Labs, uh, University of Houston, um, and Princeton uh, to uh, develop a UAV-based system. Uh, uh, Physical Sciences has developed a, uh, a, what they call the RMLD, Remote Methane Leak Detection System. Costs about, weighs about 20 pounds and slings over your shoulder. We're funding them to reduce that to less than a pound, a size that can then be uh, deployed from a a small quadcopter called the Instant Eye that PSI currently sells uh, to the military. They can essentially go to a site, traverse the perimeter in a matter of seconds, uh, combine that with wind speed and direction to determine the mass flow rate and location of leaks. And this was um, ideally a video showing that in action, uh, but there, uh, this apparently is not working, but there will be a demonstration in the technology showcase tomorrow afternoon. Bridger Photonics in Bozeman, Montana is using a similar backscatter spectrometer technique, uh, but combining that with precision LIDAR range finding to allow them to build tomographic plumes, images, uh, and use those to determine uh, location of leaks. Finally, we have one imaging technology. Um, Rebellion Photonics in Houston uh, currently manufactures a multispectral imaging system uh, that is uh, commercially available uh, it weighs 70 pounds and is deployed uh, from a uh, boom on a truck. We're funding them to reduce the cost of that, uh, reduce the weight of that uh, to less than a pound. The size, basically the size of a Red Bull can. This is a device that can then be mounted on a helmet and used by workers as they go about their daily tasks. And this was to be um, an image uh, showing that in um, operation. Uh, the sensitivity right now is uh, somewhat degraded because they have yet to put on their optical coatings, but it's stunning that they have been able to get this cost reduction in just nine months. And uh, finally, we have one enabling technology uh, with Thor Labs where we are funding them to reduce the cost of a th uh, mid-infrared laser that will benefit uh, many of our projects. Um, with that, I'll just uh, say that um, uh, this project is um, started about nine months ago. At the end of this year, the projects need to demonstrate the functionality of all the components at their sites. Um, at the, basically, by May of uh, 2016 and May of 2017, they will demonstrate the complete system at a field testing site that we will be uh, deploying. And the solicitation for developing that field test site uh, went live on our website last week. 
now I'd like to turn it over to uh, Chris Atkinson, uh, who'll be talking about uh, uh, his new program. Thanks, Brian. Good afternoon. I'm Chris Atkinson, Program Director at ARPA-E, and I'd like to talk to you about the development of a new program that un is uh, under the working title of Next Car, Next Generation Energy Technologies for Connected and Automated Road Vehicles. This is a new program in which we wish to improve the energy efficiency of the future vehicle fleet beyond current expectations by bringing together experts in powertrains, vehicle dynamics, controls and optimization, and transportation systems. The energy opportunity in transportation, as you know, is significant. Heavy duty and light duty vehicles between them consume about 11 million barrels per day of oil equivalent, totaling 81% of our transportation sector energy consumption which in itself constitutes about 23% of our primary energy usage in the United States. Oh, sorry. We would seek to reduce this significantly by the order of about 20% reduction, which would then save 4.4 quads of primary energy use per year and prevent the emissions of 0.3 gigatons of carbon dioxide emissions per year over and above the base case or business as usual. There are three overriding trends in automotive transportation today. The first is fuel economy. The future fuel economy of the light duty vehicle fleet will be substantially higher than today, no, nominally 54 and a half miles per gallon corporate average fuel economy by 2025. On the heavy duty side, heavy duty fuel economy is regulated by EPA and NHTSA and they have recently released phase two greenhouse gas rules. And we know about future fuel economy trends. They will result in significant light weighting of future vehicles, reducing aerodynamic and rolling losses, engine downsizing, engine boosting, improved transmissions, increased electrification and hybridization, waste energy recovery, and reductions in friction and parasitic losses. This is a very well-established trend, one that will continue in the, for, for the foreseeable future. The second overriding trend is vehicle connectivity. Future vehicles will utilize much greater levels of connectivity. V2V, vehicle to vehicle, V2I, vehicle to infrastructure, V2X, including vehicle to the cloud, ultimately. But this trend is driven primarily by road traffic and safety considerations. The idea that we can reduce accidents and road fatalities to, to zero. The third inexorable trend is automation. Future vehicles will display increasing levels of automation from what we have today, which are really advanced driver assistance systems. We will ultimately have L3 automation, which is automated operation with a driver present. Think of the uh, Tesla Model S with autopilot. And then ultimately L4, which is full automation with no driver required. Think of the Google car. These three trends we at RPE wish to bring together. They're all developing, they're all developing separately, they're all developing separately along their own trajectories. We seek to bring powertrain controls and optimization, vehicle dynamics and real world driving, and connected and automated vehicles together. We wish to bridge the gap in real world vehicle energy consumption by harnessing the power of connectivity and automation and we wish to engage the powertrain, vehicle, and transportation communities. Our vision goes along the following lines. What if a vehicle had perfect information about its route and the topography of its route, environmental conditions that it was due to encounter, the traffic conditions ahead, the traffic behavior ahead, the condition of its powertrain and its after-treatment systems, if indeed it does have them, the quality of its fuel, if it consumes fuel, and everything else? In addition to having perfect information, what if it cooperate, cooperated with all the vehicles around it in order to, cons to reduce its energy consumption? And it undertook this cooperation with perfect control and optimization while platooning, employing speed harmonization for congestion mitigation, eco-approach and departure from traffic signals, as well as uh, 
that same vehicle driving as an individual alone and all other real-world driving scenarios that you could anticipate. And this is the basis for our future program. We seek to reduce the energy consumption of all future vehicles by an additional 20% over and above the base case through the use of connectivity and automation. We are interested in any vehicle application, provided that the energy consumed by that class of vehicles is significant, and we approach this in an energy and fuel agnostic fashion. We have no particular preference for any fuel or energy source. Of course, future vehicles have to meet future emissions regulations, as well as cu customer acceptance requirements, which include acceleration, range, utility, and drivability. Because without meeting customer acceptance requirements, we know that these technologies will not be deployed in the future. We wish to see a $50 per percent energy consumption reduction target. That's our notional target. We wish to bring together, therefore, the powertrain community, the vehicle community, the vehicle dynamics community, and future transportation systems proponents in a program that we're calling Next Car, in the hope and in the expectation that your next car will have some piece of RPE inside it. Thank you very much. For you. Thank you, Dr. Atkinson. I'm Addison Stark. That's all right, I can introduce myself. I'm Addison Stark, I'm a fellow with RPE, um, and today I'm going to talk about moving towards carbon negative electric power. And in particular, to state somewhat the obvious that coal does grow on trees. It's just we wait a few million years to get it. So can we go ahead and rethink three main pillars of this current energy system that we have is the power plant, plants, and some sort of a fuel intermediate that we use, and finding a way to cut out the thermochemical process that we use deep underground. So trying to make a new connection through each of these. So first off, I want to address the issue of why carbon negative power. Well, when you start to look at some of the numbers recently and talking about um, emissions and, and where emissions are going, and looking at some of the studies that have been released by the IPCC, when you start to look at the, 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 the predicted carbon trajectories um, and for different climate change scenarios, if we want to achieve something that's under, say, two Celsius of global climate change, it really means we have to move towards net negative global emissions. That's actually de negative emissions globally. This is a very strenuous and difficult challenge, and when you really start to think about it, that means that net neutral technologies, things like wind, are insufficient. We need to have ways to take carbon and reverse the cycle directly into the ground. Obviously, there's been work in carbon capture for this, both enabling technologies, and we want to be able to leverage this. However, that even just doing carbon capture with fossil fuels is still insufficient. So what we want to do then is go in and move and talk about closing the loop on carbon in power generation. And one way, we, when we look at this and we look at, at, at globally, um, human emissions account for nine gigatons of carbon globally, and the U.S. is about two gigatons. But when you look at this and you look at how much carbon is cycled through the, the bio loop, uh, through photosynthesis and plant respiration, it, it, it's an order of magnitude higher. So we really do have access to a carbon flux that can do this. So let's talk about a couple of ways we want to re-envision this. And this goes back to the idea of looking at the emissions equation itself. Currently, fossil fuels are directly emitting to the atmosphere from underground, putting carbon directly into the atmosphere sink or the, the, the stock. And then, as I mentioned before, fossil fuels with carbon capture sequestration can capture a significant portion of this and put it back in the ground. Maybe 90% is what people look for. And then there are the carbon neutral approaches, wind, solar, geothermal, whatever else. Outside of the, the carbon that is used to create the technology, it really becomes a, a, a net neutral approach. Of course, there's another net neutral approach, which is utilizing bioenergy, burning it, and making electricity from it, and then re returning the carbon from the atmosphere back into the atmosphere. This ends up being net neutral. Of course, then, if we go ahead and look in combining CCS and bioenergy, we can create a technology to, or, and people are working towards this, to enable a pathway, not only to one pathway to carbon net neutral power, but I would posit one of the only pathways to carbon negative 
predictive power. And so via bioenergy, and what people call it in the literature, and you'll see it is bioenergy and carb um, with carbon capture and sequestration or BECS. And I'll be addressing some technologies I think we need to work towards enabling to actually enable a pathway towards a BECS plant. So what I've identified is, and going back to this triad again, is three innovative strategies we need to be considering or areas of work to, to enable a uh, move towards a, a BECS type powered um, generation. First is to be able to move towards this is considering fuel pretreatment for retrofit. So how do we, instead of putting biomass underground and waiting a few million years, how can we make a coal substitute in an industrially re relevant process? Um, another thing is talking about advanced power plant design that can utilize both biomass and coal in a, in a co-combustion scenario, but also in a, I'm working further towards improving and developing advanced carbon capture combustor designs. And also, what we need to look at is advanced plant design, or in order to avoid confusion, better plants for power plants. I found that that rolled off the tongue pretty well, and I enjoyed that. So let's, I'm going to touch a little bit on, on these three areas for in, in investigation. And of course, this is, this is an early jump into this. And I'm, what I'm really trying to do is ignite a little bit of conversation around this and ask you to talk to me afterwards and throughout the rest of the summit. So one of the areas that we want to look at, as I mentioned, is fuel treatment, treat, pretreatment for, for fuel switching. So essentially, we want to make biomass look and act like coal. And we've been doing this for centuries. It's techno. Technology. There we go, I think I'm cutting in an, uh, an old technology based off of the, the, the charcoal process. And one of the approaches is torrefaction that people have been looking at instead of a batch process to be able to move this over to a continuously viable industrial process. And some of the major challenges also are opportunities here, uh, I think for innovation, which is fun. But one of the big challenges is how do you scale up a reactor like this? So something that you want are dealing with solids handling and integrating solids handling and low temperature thermal management is a big challenge. In particular, how do you deal with heat integration? One of the ways that you might want to deploy something like this is in a modular and distributed production. So take a torrefaction unit, put it out into the field while you're harvesting uh, wheat or corn, and then take the waste and then make it into a coal substitute. Well, the challenge there is you can't pipe natural gas out there to run your dryers and your torrefier to be able to, to provide process heat. So this opens questions in challenges of, 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 of maintaining a combustor that's running off of a really kind of a nasty off gas. Questions in how do we do advanced combustion of really wet gases and maintaining these and having stable process integration. Another thing is good looking at the plant and in particular looking at combustor technologies that can utilize raw biomass and coal in co-combustion, and also in, 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 in uh, direct biomass combustion as well. And also finding ways to integrate more directly solid fuels for carbon capture applications. So two of the areas of work and really need to be approached here is both IGCC approaches that really focus on the integration of co-gasification, co where you have major differences in the, in the combustion efficiencies of, and the gasification reactivities of coal and biomass together in the same reactor, and also looking at things like CLC, chemical looping combustion, where you can have a process intensified version of air separation with the combustor. Lastly, I want to talk about the better plants for power plants. So what, we, what about looking at plants themselves and how well they act as a solid fuel? And so, one thing we know from just simple biochemistry is lignin looks a lot like coal chemically and also to some degree physiochemically. Uh, we have, um, it, 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 and after all, we have a type of coal, lignite, that's named after lignin. It's what remains and what really goes through the coalification process. So when we look at some of the literature in, in what work is being done towards biofuel production, there's been a lot of work towards trying to breed less lignin in plants. Well, what if we take some of the research that's been done already towards trying to get rid of lignin to make cell walls thicker and take their re re results and really run, run in the opposite direction? Can we make higher energy density plants that are, have better combustion prop properties for direct utilization as a solid fuel in power plants to give us carbon negative power? And so in summary, we want to see if we can take three, these three pieces add them together, and end up with a negative, a carbon, carbon negative power. Thank you. And 
now I'll introduce Kristen Brown, a fellow fellow of mine. Thank you. Which is the uh, uh, forward. This one's forward. Okay. Hi, good afternoon. I joined ARPA-E as a fellow two months ago, not to leverage my PhD in femtosecond electron um, spectroscopy um, or fundamental photophysics, but to help us reach a zero carbon future. And what I'm talking about today builds on what we heard this morning on democratized energy use. Often when we have conversations like we're having these next three days, we forget that the individual is at the center of what we're trying to accomplish. So my focus is on how do we empower the user to realize our full potential of energy savings. In 2009, McKinsey and company put out a fantastic study that identified the full potential of energy technologies. If we were to invest in the currently available technologies, we could save 23% of our energy, realizing $130 billion in annual energy savings. Now, if you're anything like me, you know that we're nowhere near this, especially on the individual level. To reach the individual, more than 200 home energy management systems have been developed to date. Not all of these currently exist. I think the current number is 49, but we've tried really hard. And that looks like advanced billing. That looks like thermostat control, like you heard from Jenny earlier. That looks like appliance level control. But if we look at how those are entering into the market, the numbers are pretty abysmal. What we're looking at here is a graph of revenue from industrial energy management systems in blue, business or commercial systems in red, and then home energy management systems in green. Now, if you're in the back, you probably can't see that green bar because it's nearly insignificant as a proportion of total revenue. And it's specifically insignificant if you consider that the home is one quarter of all building energy use. The revenue is small, not necessarily because of cost, but also because of market penetration. Less than 10% of homes have currently adopted smart broadband connected technologies. Furthermore, the systems that we are adopting, the things that are working, aren't maximally effective. What this graph shows, and I'll go into this in a bit more detail, is the maximum or is estimated uh, annual energy savings based on the type of system we're developing. Currently, we're focused down here in the 4 to 6% energy savings. This is something like what Opower has done quite well in maximizing energy savings through billing based on how you care personally about your energy usage, maybe in relation to your neighbors. What we aim to do is move from that 4% up to 35% using smart social science insights to connect with you as an individual and what you care about every day. So why aren't we seeing investment in these spaces? What, where do the problems come from? Well, we find that customer interaction is largely driven by lack of understanding of the current technology. You probably didn't know that over 200 systems had been developed. You also may not have the time to understand that or to go search, set up, shop for these different types of technologies. Furthermore, you might not have the money to invest in them. That money could look like a $250 uh, thermostat, or it could look like new smart appliances. And last, maybe it's not just relevant to you. Maybe you don't want your smartphone to ping every time energy use is high, you should turn off some lights. Maybe you don't want to have to do your laundry at midnight to save energy. So what do we do? How do we fix the system that we as individuals who care about this market aren't investing in? Well, the easy answer is, of course, to design a better system, something that we understand that's cheap and that's relevant. If we go back to this chart, we'll find that there's a clear roadmap on how to achieve our energy potential and drive adoption. If we think about enhanced billing, one thing that could clearly drive us is increasing the frequency of feedback. So instead of getting feedback on a monthly basis, you get feedback daily or weekly. That enables you to understand what the changes you're enacting are actually generating. We'll call that, oops, decreased latency. So the latency of feedback is a driver. Second, 
you need to understand what changes to make. So instead of saying your energy use is, is high, maybe I'll stop watching TV, maybe I'll take a cold shower. Understanding on a granular level what changes to make is important. That's increased granularity. But finally, again, this largest jump comes when we can design a system that's in real time, that's granular, but that's tailored to you as an individual. So where is the problem happening? Well, it turns out that we're not achieving this because you don't really get what's going on in your home. That's not where the breakdown of information transfer is coming from. Nor is the breakdown of information transfer necessarily happening between you and your home energy system. Where it's really occurring is between the people designing that system and how you're interacting with it. Imagine if Google or Waze was trying to give you directions without being able to measure traffic patterns in real time. They wouldn't be as effective as they currently are. Right now, if the people developing the systems want that information, that information is held by the utility company. You're not able to provide that information in real time. Our aim is to connect the designers with the information to enable them to design a tailored system. Furthermore, we find that if you can design a tailored system where you have control of your home energy at the home, that impact extends beyond just you. We're moving towards a connected grid with more increased two-way power flow. If we can use the home as a stabilization tool on our distribution network, we can realize greater potential energy savings. So I want to leave you with three key areas to think about, to discuss, and to engage with. We're looking at research opportunities in user sensing, understanding how you're interacting with your home energy while you're making those changes. We're also interested in facilitating open access data. Jenny talked a lot about HVAC control and privacy issues came up. We're interested in enabling the utility to provide data in a way that maintains customer privacy and security. And then we're also interested in systems that can adapt to you in real time. Like I said, maybe you don't care wh what feedback you need. Maybe you want that to be automated. But maybe when you come home, you still want to be able to interact with your system and not have total automation. Your home energy management system needs to create a balance of control and automation to make it most effective to you. So I encourage you over the next couple of days to think about how what you're designing integrates with the consumer you're trying to target, and if there are ways that you can better leverage smart social science insights from universities around the country to really make sure you're reaching your full potential. Thank you. And now we will end with a pitch from JC, the facilitator of our section. Thank you, Kristen. All right. So if you want to tweet, tweet you can say, Opera E tries to go nuclear again. OK. <laughs> really, we are, uh, what I'm trying to get you to think is, instead of build gigawatt nuclear reactors, can we go small, OK? 10 megawatt kind of reactors. So let me explain uh, why that makes sense. So first of all, let me just use one chart to, to explain why nuclear is essential. Okay? You can read the New York Times, Forbes, many different uh, organizations have talked about. The key is that we need nuclear as the carbon-free baseload or standing by power to balance the intermediate nature of solar and wind. Even if we get Tons of wind and solar, we need carbon-free base load power, right? That's the one. So the four top climate scientists basically point out really clearly, say we need a major expansion of nuclear power, right? But if you look at the, at the nuclear power, so this is a look at the retirement of nuclear power plants with time. And the little bit of difference between the dotted line and the, the solid line is how much new nuclear power plants have been licensed and are in the process of being built. So that's a very small amount. For this much retirement, we should build a lot and lots of nuclear power plant, but the utilities are not picking up those ones. They have a lot of challenges in terms of uncertainty in the cost. The cost can run up to $8 per watt in some of the cases. Construction delay is just a given, okay? There's no plant that has no delay so far. They put a lot of pressure on the economics because a gigawatt reactor costs billions of dollars. 
you're tied up there years and years without knowing where, where it ends. And the other one is you, you with, when the replacement power has to be identified. And after the Fukushima, the public concerns are growing. So those are the challenges we're facing. So how do we, in this kind of situation, to grow the nuclear energy, expand the nuclear energy, right? Can we think differently? And that's what I want you to think through uh, with me at this moment. So if you look at the large gigawatt reactors, these are huge, I mean huge. Okay? This is not an endorsement of any way. And uh, so if you, if you look at one, there are millions and millions of welds. So every reactor, even though the same design, the same size, that would be licensed separately, that would be certified separately, and then any changes cause delays. That's the big factor. The on-site certification, on-site licensing process is the big driver for those uncertainty in cost and delays, okay? So can we think it differently, right? Can we change the paradigm into make a transition from an on-site certification to an in-factory certification, okay? Can we make nuclear reactors like we make jet engines, literally like that, okay? Making in factories certifies once for each type of reactor and then transport the site. We need to make them so safe and secure that you, as you fly over here, you don't even think about it, that the big jet engine sit on the side of the airplane, right? Because it's so safe. We need that kind of safety, inherent safety, passive safety. You can walk away without worry about it, right? It has to be extremely secure, right? So in that case, we can make the order, we can talk to different sites. There are a lot of advantage of doing that, right? Because of the size, now if we can make it in 10 megawatt, we can, we can transport by transportation, regular road transportation. We can literally put this reactor in an earthquake shake table, a shake to 9.0 magnitude, and, and that can test the, you know, the safety and security, just like we test jet engines. I work at GE for 12 years, so I love this jet engine thing, but I don't have time to explain long. So the jet engine, right, we put a four and a half tons per minute of water into it, just to simulate the, the takeoff in a storm, right? We put the ice into it, we put a five and a half, you know, pounds of bird into it to try the bird to strike. The most dramatic one, this is the bird coming in, is, is this blade out experiment. So if one of the blades goes out, literally have so much power, you can take a mid-sized car, 100 some feet above ground. We have to contain this one, okay? I don't have time to show you the video, but this is the steer frame. So this is four speed, one blade is out, you can see the fire and smoke, and then finally, it's, when it's coming down, everything is contained. We need a, this kind of rigor to test our small nuclear reactors so that they're safe, they can, you can put it in your backyard. That kind of safety is required for this to work. So because of that, you know, you, you really just tremendous amount of safety that you can go. I think the country really have tremendous expertise and, and, uh, and experience of making this work. I think we have the strongest foundation. There's a four trillion dollar business opportunities. I think this country needs to grab this opportunity instead of pass it around, pass around, okay. And uh, we have, we'll have a workshop in two weeks in, here in Washington, talk about this, this concept. When you have 10 megawatt sizes, there are tremendous flexibilities, okay? The, the utility don't have to tie up billions of dollars. They can buy five of them, they can buy 10 of them, they can tie the different sites, right? You can enable cogeneration, desalination, and so on and so forth. The other thing that I was thinking, you can potentially use in some of the retired, that the sites that are scheduled to be retired, put a new reactor there, they use the site. So you have the securities there, and, and so on and so forth. So here's the, basically the, the, the basic idea, okay. So we want to, I'm, I'm not against the gigawatt reactors. If you have the money, you have, you have the you know, stomach to build it, just go build it. Yeah? What I'm trying to say is we can expand our nuclear reactor, nuclear power by moving away from this on-site certification model to a in-factory certification model. Literally make the nuclear reactor just like we make jet engines, okay? The tremendous advantage of doing that, you know, we can design it so safe and secure that we can use different methodologies in this case, and uh, so, such as like a solid core, instead of using this circular tube in the water type of uh, reactor, 
You can use solid core, supercritical CO2 type of, type of heat transfer material, or some other technologies. I just want to mention that in, you know, in terms of this one, the space technology folks, when they launch a, a nuclear device into space, they have to demonstrate if something happens, this, there's a launch failure. This stuff come back either to the ocean or to the, to the Earth. They have to demonstrate there's no nuclear accident in that case. So there are technologies there. We need to transition that technology to make it into civilian applications. And then in that case, if we can do this one, then we can have minimum delay and much reduce the you know, capital requirement for the utilities. And then we only need to, to that's the key, okay? Only need to, 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 to do the licensing once for each type of reactor, each size of reactor. So we don't have the, that much delay. Every site is different and so on and so forth. And then we can transport a site and then when you use it, you can took, take the whole reactor and put it in a storage site. So the decommi decommission cost is much lower you know, there's no uh, local storage. That's a no need for, for anti spend of fuel storage and so on and so forth. So we can expand the usage of nuclear reactor. So basically, this is the, the what I'm pitching. You know, make and certify nuclear reactors in factories, just like we do jet engines, and make them as safe or more safe than the jet engines, so then you don't have to worry about it. Okay, so that's what uh, I'm pitching. Thank you very much. All right, we have, uh, so please uh, tweet your, uh, text your uh, question to, uh, to this uh, address, okay? So we have lots of uh, good questions. The first question is for Kristen. And big changes are required in, in utility business model and the willingness to share data. Is it reasonable to expect changes in the near term? That's a great question. Um, and an obviously extremely relevant one. What our goal, of course, is to build the technologies that enable the utility to adopt them with as little disruption as possible. Um, I'm not in the business of disrupting business models. Uh, that's not what my background is. I leave that to the MBA grads who I work wonderfully with. But I think we need a change in how people view integration of information in the utility sector like we see how we integrate with our smartphones currently. So if we can build up the technology in a way that keeps in mind how the utility business model is structured, I think that we can reach a point of integration into that current business model. Great. The second question is for Addison. How does BC, uh, BECCS compare to direct air uh, capture in terms of negative CO2 potential? Well. One thing I, I, the way I'm looking at it is with BECCS or BEX, you get a, you get, you can access stored solar energy in the form of the plant to drive your process. Now, the, I haven't run through the numbers yet. This is me thinking of ways to enable a pathway forward. But certainly, this is, I guess, you know, in a way, plants serve as a self-assembling um, direct air capture plants that then you can uh, collect and utilize. Um, it's an open question about how it directly compares on a overall potential, but certainly it, it must be part of a suite uh, to move forward, at least in the displacement of traditional fossil approaches. Okay. So the, there's another question for you, too. How much land area would be required to displace coal? Well, coal accounts for something like 39% of our are 16.5 quads or something like that is coal power in the U.S. Um, I think that it would take a lot. I, I would have to run the numbers through the on a piece of paper. I would assume it would take more than we're not going to be able to displace completely. However, you know, it'd be part of a suite. Now, I mean, obviously, from what we are looking at for the overall carbon trajectories that we need to achieve. You know, it's not going to be purely displacing all of coal, but you can utilize other technologies such as nuclear power and um, wind and other carbon neutral approaches. But we do need to have some sort of carbon negative sources of energy moving forward if we are to hit these targets of keeping warming below 2 degrees Celsius. So it's part of a suite of technologies that must be approached, I believe. 
The next question is for Brian. And uh, is there a cost savings to oil and gas industry from leak reductions? If so, is there an industry research program already? Why not? So there is uh, cost savings from the reduction of leakage. And uh, several of the studies have shown that, um, uh, that a large number of the uh, methane mitigation programs, in fact, are, are uh, uh, revenue positive to revenue uh, neutral. Uh, however, uh, we then get into uh, leaks that are not um, necessarily cost effective to uh, detect, but have a significant impact on the environment. And in general, if we were to fully cost the externalities by using something like a social cost of carbon, then it brings those uh, into, uh, into, into line. Uh, but there, um, uh, there are companies that are currently doing um, measurement services, and we believe that uh, a similar industry would uh, um, emerge or grow uh, based on the monitor technologies. Okay. The next question is also for you. Is OPERA also funding software to detect leaks given sensor data or just the physical sensors, chips, or other equipment? I'm sorry, could you? Is OPERA also funding software? Oh, so, uh, so yes, the, um, the six complete systems that we talked about uh, essentially consist of two components. Um, one is a measurement system, uh, some sort of a physical sensor, and the other is um, a uh, uh, software algorithms that uh, take that data and then either use uh, wind data, wind speed data, or other forms of uh, dispersion modeling uh, to uh, allow them to actually quantify the leak rate and to estimate where on the site um, within actually a distance of one meter the leak is occurring. Okay. The next question is for me. I think the, the question is, uh, the Navy has small nuclear reactors for ships. Why not using them? And we're not trying to not use them. And then we wanted to see, you know, we were inviting them to the workshop, want to see how safe and secure those ones for the, for the civilian use. I think that most of them are austere water-based systems, like how safe they are, and we want to evaluate that. So and that would be the, my answer. Uh, there's a... A question for Kristen. Why should the individual care about the services, uh, services savings, the, saving them $5 a month? Isn't the energy too cheap to matter? That's another great question. <laughs> um, so, so the more that I've dived into this field, the, the more philosophical of a question that really becomes. And there's a belief that if we reach a point of complete automation, then we're no longer connected enough to the world around us. And so there's a balance between automation and control. And so it's not necessarily an energy savings. For you as an individual, the impetus shouldn't necessarily be the dollar. Maybe that's resource savings. Maybe it is competition. That's where partnering with people who understand how you're driven and what motivates you becomes important in designing these technologies. I think we know that it's not a dollars and cents argument. I don't know how much my electricity bill was last month. It's set up on auto pay. <laughs> but maybe I need to care about the impact it has on the environment and I need that information to be portrayed to me in a way that resonates with that. That's the type of system we're looking to develop. Okay. The next question is for Chris. Isn't the integration already ongoing in passenger cars and heavy duty vehicles? What's really different that you want to do? Good question. Uh, connectivity is, as I said, is, is, is an ever increasing area of interest for the automotive industry, but it's primarily driven by safety. There's a technology known as DSRC. Um, that offers short-wave communications, short-range communications between vehicles. But the ultimate goal there is to reduce accidents, as I said. The idea would be that each vehicle would know what the vehicle ahead of it, or the vehicle ahead of that, was doing on a 20-millisecond uh, basis. 
These are technologies, as I say, that are well regarded, well explored, and well researched, but primarily for safety. On the other hand, we have fuel economy regulations that are very well established and offer a trajectory for the industry to follow. But there's this gray space in the middle, which is that connectivity, automotion, and fuel economy are not linked. They are not linked today. They are not linked in anybody's technology plan so far as we know. We at RPE seek to make that first linkage between connectivity, automotion, and fuel economy. And that's where we believe we can make a difference. I think this question is relevant to the, to the previous question. How can next car compete with or work with autonomous cars program at GoGo and GM and etc.? That's a, another good question. Uh, the more energy a vehicle consumes, obviously, the greater the ability for smart technologies to reduce that energy consumption. The idea in the industry is that once we get to L4 automation, which is the Google car, as you've seen it perhaps in the press, the idea is that once all vehicles are at L4 automation with no driver intervention required and are intrinsically safe, we can reduce the mass of those vehicles significantly. Once you reduce the mass significantly, the energy required to drive them drops significantly. So the opportunity for efficiency improvements of L4 vehicles is fairly small. But until we reach that time, we will have vehicles that look very similar to the cars of today that will offer increasing levels of automation and will still consume significant amounts of energy. And that's really the target that we seek to address. It's the vehicles of the next two or three decades which will, in large part, still be driven, uh, still be driven by fuel combusting engines, although perhaps there'll be significant hybrid penetration, significant plug-in hybrid penetration. Those are the vehicles, really, that consume the most energy, and those vehicles have the most opportunity for fuel efficiency and energy efficiency reduction. So those are the ones to target in the next two or three decades. Great, thank you. The next question is for me. So regarding spin the fuel and the decomm decommission costs, does me doesn't megawatt scale actually increase those costs by spreading the contaminated materials? Uh, so basically, the, this is a, the megawatt reactor. They have the design so safe, and also the fuel is in, a, we are thinking, in a very solid core, the entire core. Even if you shoot a projector into it, it wouldn't break into pieces. In that kind of case, the whole reactor can be towed away. There's nothing spread around. So that's the whole idea is try to make the decommission extremely uh, you know, low cost, basically tow it away and, and store in a, in a central storage site so that you don't have to spend the fuel storage uh, on site, just like now the, most of the large reactors have spent the fuel on, on site. That's more. That's a lot more, uh, you know, concern of a concern, right? Uh, so the next question is for uh, Edison. When you talk about uh, the advanced the power plants, what do you envision differently from the previous IGCC plant design? I think it's uh, a lot is going to have to be around making sure your gasification technology can do co-combustion, co-gasification, and can handle large volumes of biomass with coal. So a lot of the current iteration has really been focused on in train flow gasifiers. There needs to be a lot, um, which work well for, for coal. Uh, a lot more work needs to be done in fluid, fluidized bed multi-phase reactors, um, and uh, the, enabling the ability to utilize co-gasification, because the gasifier serves as a homogenization step at that point. You're getting a uniform mixture of syngas, which can be more uniformly and more predictably combusted for your, for your um, combined cycle down, downstream. So, but first really needs to be a lot more focus on long, high availability reactor technology that, that won't break down so readily in different inhomogeneous types of mixtures of biomass and coal. Because one thing that's different between biomass and coal is with coal, you generally have a contract at one train after the next has pretty much the same combustion characteristics. With biomass, it'll change seasonally. It could change with one shipment of a waste biomass to another. You need to have better dynamic control and understanding of how your reactor conditions will change. So I think a lot of work can be done really around there for improving 
um, the, the, the reactor technology for the current, I mean, you wouldn't rethink the overall system of the IGCC, but you really need to focus on the upfront fuel conversion step. Great, thank you. This uh, question is for Brian. So would the monitor technologies have changed how and how quickly if the Porter Ranch methane leak was identified <laughs> before? Uh, <clears throat> monitor technologies uh, may have been able to uh, detect uh, the emissions uh, much earlier. We don't know the early stages and, and warning signs and leakage uh, from that storage facility, uh, but there may have been um, leakage occurring before the, uh, the full eruption began. That's purely hypothetical. Uh, but it was uh, a, a period of days before, uh, th uh, three days before that, ac that information actually became public. Uh, there's been a lot of uh, speculation on what the leak rate is from Aliso Canyon. That's currently being done by, uh, the, the, uh, uh, the work for that is, is currently being done by uh, aircraft flying around the plume, uh, making concentration measurements, integrating that with dispersion models to estimate the leak rate. What we're proposing is that that will be done on a uh, smaller scale at every well site, uh, a, b being able to quantify uh, the mass fluorate being um, emitted uh, from, uh, from every well. Uh, so while it uh, wouldn't have probably changed the course in Aliso Canyon, uh, the fact that a, a vice president of, uh, of environment, health, and safety gets a report on leakage from his pipeline system every month, uh, we believe, would uh, spur uh, voluntary and significant efforts to uh, reduce uh, methane emissions. Okay, the next question is for Chris, so hopefully you can have a very quick answer for this one. Have you taken security concern into consideration? Automotive industry has poor track record with software security. That's another very good question with regards to connectivity. Um, the, the, the security um, of the messaging from vehicle to vehicle or from vehicle to infrastructure or from vehicle to cloud is obviously of enormous importance. We believe that that technology will be developed and be refined by others, again, because these are safety critical applications are considered the first, the first applications of choice in the industry. We at RPE anticipate that technologies that we develop will simply piggyback onto those existing protocols and that that is essentially a problem that will be solved by others. But it's a good, it's a good, it's a good concern and, 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 and a valid one. All right. Thank you very much, Chris. I think that's all the time we have. We will be here. If you have any questions and any comments, please come, come up and see us. Thank you very much. And the, the showcase will be down there. <laughs>